The objective today is to describe the difference between AMD and Intel chips, and to be a little more specific, I want you to be able to tell the difference between x86, x86-64, or sometimes you'll see it as x86-64, also AMD64, and x64. This video is a result of me being very frustrated every time I saw any of these terms it was hard for me to differentiate between them but now I think I'm good and so I'm going to bring that lesson to you today. Basically, all these are just references to a type of architecture with the latter three referring to the 64-bit nature of the underlying 86 architecture. So these latter three, x86, 64, AMD 64, and 64 is without a doubt referring to the 64-bit nature of a computer system. These three, though, do not exist without this underlying x86 architecture. Okay, so let's start with this. x86 was introduced, I'm putting quotations around that word introduced, because the design started in 1976. By 1978, the Intel felt confident enough to introduce the architecture or at least introduce their plans for this architecture. But a chip that actually used this architecture was released in 1979. So let's kind of stick with this right now in our minds, 1978. Um, by 1985, they have a 32-bit version of this type of architecture. And then by 2003, Intel is going to come out with an x86-64 or just straight x64 chip utilizing the ability to make addresses and instructions uh, 64 bits long. Now if you don't really understand what I'm saying when I say system or instruction set, I do have a video on that so be sure to watch that. But it's basically what I just said, a 64 bit address and or operator. And also operands can be 64 bits long. So we're talking very big numbers. So down here in bold, these three terms are the exact same thing. Well, maybe I should say has the same ability. There will be some nuances that I cover in a little bit. So pay attention to these dates. A long time ago, in 1978, Intel had created this idea. And so when I say architecture, I don't think it would be a stretch for your mind to go to like a house architecture. See, here is a type of architecture that many home builders can use. You have your front door here, so when a person walks in, uh, they go down this kind of hallway area. It looks like there's a closet. When you get to the end of the hallway, you can look over here at a living room. The television's here. The kitchen's over here. You can have strange and unique things to your architecture. Here's like a planted area that looks really cool. So there's an architecture that people can copy. Over here is a CPU architecture. It happens to be MCS650X. X as in like it could be a variety of numbers. So as you can see right here, like this is the area that um, decodes instructions and the ALU is over here. That's the arithmetic logic unit. So the ones and zeros as in the um, patterns of electricity is going through this architecture and the results are the things we care about. Can this architecture deliver a fast performance? Can this architecture keep the heat away from our chips so that things don't catch on fire or burn our lap when we have a laptop on our lap? So let's think about a pop quiz here. I'm saying that x86 is an architecture. Let's say you're in a bookstore and you see modern x86 assembly language programming. You see this term modern architecture. Let's go back to our dates here and wrap our minds around this. I said in 1978, x86 architecture was used for 16-bit systems. And then in 1985, the x86 was used in 32-bit systems. But now, ever since 2003, and I'm making this video in 2019, now x86 is using 64-bit systems to accomplish its goal of computer performance. So my pop quiz question is, will you be learning about 64-bit systems if you read this? And I don't want you to get too confused if you go off on a journey Googling these things I'm talking about, because sometimes you'll see some really crazy things like this AMD Project Skybridge. Project Skybridge was a thing where 
this company AMD is trying to build a socket or a motherboard you know you have a socket on a motherboard they wanted to build this socket that could take either an x86 chip or an ARM chip you see that's the difference between x86 and ARM is these are totally two different architectures they both totally you see 64 right there they both could totally be 64-bit systems with 64-bit addresses and instructions that's not a big deal but on my googling journey to bring you this lesson I ran across that concept and really wanted to dig in and just the hits that I got from Google right here kinda says it all and just so you know ARM is a architecture it's a design that is used on cell phones they're particularly good for cell phone chips but unlike Intel or AMD they don't make the chips themselves they just sell the design to companies like Qualcomm but let's focus here so I can get off this page it says AMD canceled project Skybridge because global foundries blah 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 so I had to look up global found foundries as well it sounds like this is just a manufacturing company they make chips and apparently they didn't see a need for Project Skybridge. And this last hit down here kind of says everything you need to know about this architecture concept. It says AMD announces Project Skybridge, pin compatible ARM and 86. So the problem would occur at the pin level. See, these are processors. Processors have pins to get the ones and zeros, the um, bits of electricity to and from the places they need to go. Here's a better picture of a processor where every single pin right here is identified so for them to somehow combine two different architectures on one socket the thing that this plugs into that seemed like a pretty big task so maybe I'm not surprised it failed because that was just such a big undertaking it says x64 is a generic term for the 64-bit extensions to Intel's and AMD's 32-bit x86 instruction set architecture AMD introduced the first version of x64 which is kind of ironic because Intel Intel was the first company to create this x86 architecture which was originally not even 32 bits it was 16 bit I'll get to that in a second but AMD the first to get to 64 bits and what they did is they initially called um, this x86-64 but they later renamed it to AMD 64 now Intel named their implementation IA32E and then they named it EMT64 here's something that's worthy of a note it says that there are some slight incompatibilities between the two versions but most code key most code works fine on both versions now you can find details by reading the architecture software developers manuals for Intel I have a video series where I'm doing that I can't promise it's very entertaining but it's very educational at least for me and then if you wanted to read AMD's version of their the manual you could find that by googling this for some reason they call their manual architecture tech docs but nonetheless even though there's uh, slight differences we call this whole intersection concept uh, flavor x64 so if you see x64 it's referring to either Intel or AMD chips and then don't make the mistake of thinking x64 is like the same thing as IA-64. IA-64, I think a lot of people hate this. This apparently is a totally different thing than x86-64. I don't know much about it though, so you could go ahead and research that. So, our objective, describe the difference between AMD and Intel. Okay, you know so far that they both make chips, that's not a difference. Unless you're thinking that the difference is they're two different companies, which is very true. The similarity they have, they both design x86 chips. And then let's talk about ARM briefly, because AMD is an acronym, like ARM is an acronym. But think of ARM like you hold a cell phone in your hand and you use your arm to bring the cell phone up to your ear. ARM is a chip designed for cell phones mostly. So let's walk through a timeline real quick. 1968 is when Intel became a company. Intel stands for Integrated Electronics. Now the next year, 1969, they produced the world's first metal oxide semiconductor static RAM. So this is a memory thing. That was their first big product, it sounds like. Now two years later, they're really working on microprocessors, so they come up with a 4-bit 
processor called the 4004, or maybe 44. And here's an Italian sounding name, Federico Fagan. So if it says designed by him, that means that is his architecture. So we are not at the x86 stage yet. Again, remembering 1971 is not 1976 when that x86 research began. Now right down here I put Google Image Search because I do not know what a magnetic core is. But apparently this is something that made Intel famous because they came up with this static type of RAM and they named it 1101. It signaled the end of magnetic core memory. So when I Google image magnetic core memory, this is what I got, and for me, it is not really helpful. But what is helpful is the knowledge of what made them famous. And when I Google 1101 RAM, something that looks like a chip is what pops up. But maybe I'll make a video on that after I do some research, and that is if I continue to be interested in the historical part of this lesson. I really am more concerned with um, the differences between the microprocessors here. Okay, so the Intel 4004, just a little bit more about this chip, it is a 2000 transistor chip. And apparently its first use was for a Japanese calculator, I'm wondering if that's what this is right here. And I pulled this timeline from Computer World, as you're about to see, I mean the link's right there. So Computer World was saying this was a far-sighted thing to do, to call this particular 4004 chip, see, C4004 to call this chip a microprogrammable computer on a chip. So I'm wondering, is this about the time, 1971, when people start using the term chip to mean microprocessor? Now the next chip to come about was in 1972. Intel announces the 8-bit 8008 processor. I have a video on this chip in particular. And the cool fact here is that teenagers Bill Gates and Paul Allen, they try to develop a programming language for the chip, but it is not powerful enough. So I'm not sure if Computer World is saying that the programming language is not powerful enough, or the chip is not powerful enough to handle that, the language that they were working on. But more on that in a little bit, let me tell you right now that in 1974, Intel introduced the 8-bit 8080 processor. Now this 8080 processor had 4,500 transistors and 10 times the performance of its predecessor. So if you're like me, these numbers sure are hard to remember. I mean 8008 versus 8080 and next up is 8800. So in 1975, the 8080 chip finds its first PC application in the Altair 8800. So this chip finds a home in this computer, and this is what's considered the beginning of the PC revolution. So 1975, PC revolution begins, and guess what? Gates and Allen succeed in developing the Altair basic language. So after failing with the 8008 chip, they find a home in the 8080 chip. And if you're wondering, is this the same Paul Allen who owns the Seattle Seahawks? Yes. And I assume most of you already know who Bill Gates is. And for most of my life, I had only known Bill Gates as famous because of Microsoft. I heard he made the Microsoft Windows operating system. But apparently this basic language came first. So moving on, in 1976, the x86 architecture suffers a setback. Okay, this is the part I get really confused about. And again, Computer World is writing it. Computer World says that the x86 architecture suffered a setback in 76. I don't know why it says that, because I don't think that the x86 architecture had even began until 1976. So how can it get a setback if somebody else, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, are working on another architecture? In this case, an architecture that'll go in the Apple II computer, and this one is called the 6502. Or maybe I should say the MCS internal architecture, or just MCS architecture. I don't know much about the architecture, I just know that when you use 6502 assembly, it's a more intuitive assembly language to use than the x86. But, as far as I know, again, double check some of these things I say to you, I don't think anyone's using 6502 anymore. You will see that processor in the show Futurama, it's in Bender's head, and also if you watch the movie Terminator, you'll see a 6502 reference in that movie as well. So here we go, maybe the most important date of the day, and that is when the Intel 8086 processor design starts. 
So I'm not sure how it could be a setback unless they're saying that if this chip came out first, Apple would not have been so successful. But nonetheless, they are designing it in 1976, working on it for two years, and finally in July 1st, 1979, it is released, and this architecture that they used for this chip is where the name came from. So the moment you've all been waiting for, what is the origin of the X and then the 86? It's because this architecture is based on that chip. And then there's going to be several successors, such as the 8186, the 8286, and so on. And they're all using that same architecture. And what I had found, and there's the pin layout, what I found is this 86 concept is just a vendor ID. Here I am thinking maybe it's because there were 86 pins, which I don't think I'm too big of an idiot for thinking that because like modern processors today are up to like 900 pins. But no, in terms of x86, that pin, that pin count only goes up to 40 here. So there you go, Intel designed the architecture, but who created the first 64-bit CPU? That honor goes to AMD. Except uh, maybe Apple can be considered a tie with them, because what this says is that Apple also ships the 64-bit G5 PowerPC CPU, and PowerPC is an IBM thing. Apple's using this PowerPC design and they have 64-bit addresses and instruction sets, so maybe there's a tie between those two. This is an interesting article about that time period. The title is AMD brought 64-bit to x86. And at the time of this article, that is 10 years ago, so the article is April 2013. If I go down and read this first paragraph, it says AMD's lavish New York launch for the Opteron processor was far more than a product launch. It was AMD showing it could reproduce the success of the Athlon K7 chip and take the fight to Intel by developing groundbreaking new features and not just one-upping its rival on some benchmarks. The firm's Opteron processor brought 64-bit computing to the commodity x86 chip market along with an on-die memory controller and the hyper transport bus all in one product. So a big deal there in 2003. Now there is a good discussion about this difference between these different x86, x32, x64 architectures on Stack Overflow. But what I did here is try to pull out a really good nugget of information. It says that the x64 is the architecture name for the extensions to the x86 instruction set that enables 64-bit code. It was invented by AMD and later copied by Intel when they couldn't get their own 64-bit arch to be competitive. So that goes back to this IA64 that we talked about, this itanium chip that, according to this person, it did not fare well. Then the guy goes on to say that other names for it are x86-64, AMD's original name, and commonly used one in open source tools. I thought AMD's original name for it was AMD64, but regardless, it says, Intel's, it says Intel tried to come up with its own name for this extension, EM64T and Intel64, but apparently these names never caught on. And to really wrap your mind around these different name changes, I try to create this summary of a pretty good paragraph that basically is playing around with all the names for this extension. So here in blue, we have AMD calling this concept x86-64 and AMD-64. Then here's Intel, and those are the names that Intel uses. First, it went with IA32E then EM64T, and finally Intel 64. Now, Microsoft and Sun, two totally different type of tech companies, um, they're using the term X64. And here's an example of Microsoft Windows designating its 32-bit versions to the term X86. So sometimes if you see X86 all by itself, it's referencing the 32-bitness of whatever it is talking about. Usually that'd be like software or a processor. Those low-level software engineers need to know what they're working with, whether it's 32 or 64 bits. So eventually here, you'll see me get down to a purple, you know, maybe blue and red combined make purple. I mean, when 
you think about it, AMD and Windows is going to use this term, so maybe that is the big term. It's just been my personal experience that when I see x86, I usually see a dash 64, so I was under the impression that this was the most common term. So now when you Google maybe AMD and Intel differences, you'll find a lot of articles about which chip is better. That is not as interesting to me because like in tech, often the answer to those questions, what is better, is it depends. So Lenovo has an article here that begins by saying we offer computers with both processors in them. It says Intel's processors offer a number of strengths, including power conversion, graphics performance, processing speed, and processing power. However, Intel processors also tend to be more expensive than their AMD counterparts, something to be mindful of if you're on a budget. By comparison, AMD processors tend to be more affordable. Additionally, AMD processors can do things that Intel chips can't. Whereas most Intel processors are locked in at fixed clock speeds, many AMD processors can be overclocked. So if you're a techie without very much money, it sounds like AMD is going to be the best choice. So that's the end of the lesson. Let me kind of get you started here. If you could come up with a table, like a Venn diagram kind of example of the differences between um, Intel and AMD, that'd be great. And to make things even more confusing, if you're looking at a motherboard, I mean, sometimes those chips can go into the same socket. Sometimes they can't. You just need to check the socket. Maybe to get your roll in here, you could say that they both went from 32 to 64 bits, so that's what they have in common. But don't forget AMD was the first to get to 64, and Intel was the first to get to 32 in the sense that they're the ones who created this x86 architecture to begin with. And if we base anything on that last article, it sounds like Intel is still doing better than AMD in terms of performance. Maybe that's why those chips are a little more expensive. But if you're allowed to overclock AMD chips and you can do that successfully, then that means those chips are better than the Intel chips. Again, everything just seems to boil down to like, what are your needs and what are your capabilities? So there's just a lot that you could do with this chart to go ahead and give this to me in the comments if you feel so moved and you're not in my class.